We have a fantastic uh, uh, panel uh, coming up here. My name is Alan Marco. Um, I am the Deputy Chief Economist at the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, and we have a, a panel on economic growth and innovation. I'd like to switch up the timing a little bit and start off with uh, taking my uh, moderator's uh, prerogative and uh, make a couple opening remarks um, about uh, 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 e economics and um, uh, the economics of innovation, and as somebody, as an, really an outsider in terms of looking at the arts, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about how um, it's an exciting opportunity to be exposed to uh, people who are doing uh, work in economics, uh, innovation, um, and the arts. Uh, so I am a bit of an, of an outsider uh, in this. My, re my own research has looked at innovation in a, from a very technical standpoint, really oftentimes looking at patents, uh, uh, utility patents, looking at um, uh, patent litigation and firm strategy. Uh, but I am the, the, the son of a, a statistician and a musician. Um, I got most of the stats. My sister got most of the uh, music and arts. And in fact, she is, uh, she works in the, in the arts with a, an organization called EMC Arts, which uh, she tells me does work in uh, innovation and uh, the arts in terms of the actual management practices of, of arts organizations. Um, so she was excited uh, that that I was uh, that I was here at the NEA. She also used to work at the NEA. Um, so it's, an, it's a good opportunity for me to see this from, uh, in a sense, from the outside. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit, just to set the stage for some of the papers, um, and, and tie them together a little bit in terms of talking about a couple of the big issues in economics. The previous uh, session was a fantastic um, uh, uh, opening for that, uh, because a lot of the issues that the, they were discussing are important big issues in economic uh, growth. And as we're talking about growth and the arts uh, in, in this session, I wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, number one, in terms of um, the economics of growth, there's a really big uh, question, a really big problem in looking at this, which is what leads to economic growth? But really, the second question is almost as important, growth of what? Right? Uh, how do we measure growth? And what are we talking about? Well, we use uh, GDP per capita a lot as an uh, economist. Um, and uh, we rely on this in large part because it's easy, right? We can find data on GDP per capita. It's easy. Um, but GDP has, has a couple known problems. Number one, uh, as, uh, as V. Grillicus and other uh, scholars have noted, um, suppose that uh, innovation leads primarily to lower prices. If that's the case, then GDP will go down. So at the very, uh, at the very least, GDP would understate uh, certain kinds of growth. Um, uh, William Nordhaus has a famous example about this looking at um, uh, lumens, uh, lumen output of lighting per man hour worked over time, over human history. It goes back to, I forget uh, what year, uh, BC, to look at this. But for most of human history, we've had less than one lumen per man hour that we can uh, produce, or less than one lumen of lighting that we can produce with one hour of work. Uh, less than one for most of human history, even to the 1800s, really to the, to the invention of the light bulb. Since the invention of the light bulb, we're at about 10,000 lumens per man hour. So when you look at, at, at growth in that sense, right, it's, uh, it's a very different picture, not a very different picture, but a much more extreme picture than you get even um, from looking at GDP per capita. Um, looking at issues of quality of life, right, what does it mean to you that there is uh, a symphony in your, uh, in your town, in, in your city? Um, what does it mean to you that there are public museums? How do we value that? And there are ways that we can potentially value that, but they're not really put into GDP. Um, the, the research in the economics of happiness has looked into some of these, these questions. Environmental quality is not in GDP. Um, the value of information, um, unless we, we can see transactions on that, is not in GDP. Um, how do you put a price on the fact that someone on the other side of the world can instantaneously and costlessly download a picture of you from 20 years ago in college wearing a pair of boxers on your head as a hat. How can you put a price on that indeed? Um, how, how do you put a price on the fact that you, can, that you can walk down the street with a symphony playing in your ear and with a touch of a button answer a phone call at the same time? Um, I can listen to Alec Baldwin reading to my uh, children and show them Thomas the Tank Engine on my iPod. How do you put a price on that? You can put a price on the iPod, but how do you put a price on, the, on that change of information? As one of our panelists um, uh, has pointed out, um, uh, what matters is consumer participation in some ways, not consumption. So in the networked economy, right, consumers want to have, in some sense, want to have relationships with uh, the producers. Right? Want to have relationships with, with, with producers. They want to friend them on Facebook. 
uh, I can tell you right now, I'm only going to friend organizations uh, where uh, I have a choice, right? So I'm really not going to friend Comcast, but there might be other providers. Uh, Timberland, I might, I might friend because I really I enjoy their products. It's different from me willing to, to, to put money uh, uh, down for a, a, a pair of shoes. So there are a lot of um, uh, issues here, and some of them get to this arts and, and innovation, right? If I can listen to a symphony in my ear, um, walking down the street, uh, to what extent does technology, technological um, uh, innovation, relate to uh, the arts um, and the diffusion of arts? Uh, so one of the big problems in, in the arts and in innovation at large uh, is, the, is the spillover problem, right? So there are lots of spillovers, and we need, how do we solve that? So one of the big ways that we solve uh, the spillover problem, one of the ways that we solve the spillover problem in, uh, in innovation, technological innovation, is with intellectual property. I mean, it also, in, it's one of the tools that we use to solve that problem in uh, the arts, in some form of the arts. So that's uh, an element of my research, certainly. Um, and the, the Patent and Trademark Office and the Economic and Statistical Administration of the Department of Commerce recently came out with a uh, report on IP-intensive industries. And we find that, that employment in, and that's, that's a very, you know, I won't talk about, much about how we, how we measure that, but uh, employment in sort of copyright-intensive industries is just as, uh, just as high as employment in patent-intensive industries. So we get copyrights, patents, may not be a surprise to you that the most employment comes from trademark intensive industries because it's hard to think of a firm that you purchase something from that's not using trademarks. Um, so th these are important drivers, and not the only drivers, right? We, we rely on some subsidization, subsidization and other things, but this big spillover problem is something that's similar between the arts and technological uh, innovation. Um, uh, within those spillovers, they tend to be localized. So um, uh, the panelists today will talk in, in some part about this localization of these spillovers that is subsidizing, um, uh, it, it may be important to subsidize local uh, uh, industries, local arts organizations, because it has a localized impact. There are, of course, broader global impacts of technology and, um, and the arts, but they do, you know, research has, has shown that they tend to be localized and they diffuse over time. Um, so we'll hear more about that with, with, localized, uh, with localization and, and uh, arts districts and so forth. Um, and uh, last, I just wanted to mention this complementarity between the arts and technology. So one of our panelists will talk about uh, uh, whether, in fact, some arts uh, background um, increases your technological productivity as a researcher, right, as an engineer. Um, and what does that mean? So exposure to arts may actually change something, it may have a causal effect, there may be a correlation there. Um, and you only need to look at, at Steve Jobs as kind of an example of this. So after his death, the Patent, uh, patent and Trademark Office had an exhibit about all of his patents. Now, um, for those of you who know something about the patent system, there are design patents and there are utility patents. Utility patents are what we think of as those, the technological uh, right, innovations, but there are design patents as well. We can think of designers creating design patents and, and inventors creating uh, utility patents, um, but Steve Jobs was both, right? He had a set of design patents, he had a set of utility patents, and it got me thinking, well, what's the overlap there? And to what extent is there this kind of, you know, can, can we tell something about that creative side that may influence that, that other kind of creative uh, 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 side in, in technological uh, innovation? And so I did a little uh, work on this, looking at some uh, inventor data, and I found that of, uh, if you think of designers as being design patent uh, uh, creators and, and inventors being utility patent creators, and there's a subset of those who do both. Well, of all inventors, about only about 5% are also designers. But of all designers, about 40% are also inventors. But more importantly, if you look at designer inventors, they're about one and a half to two times more productive in terms of the number of patents that they issue, number of utility patents that they issue. So if you're a designer, one and a half to two times as many utility patents um, uh, uh, grants as um, inventors alone. Um, so with that, I, I, and, I, and I think that that's, that's an important um, uh, thing to, for us to be thinking about, uh, about these complementarities that may exist. Uh, and with that, I want to turn to um, our panel. We're going to have three panelists. Um, uh, Margaret uh, Jane uh, Wisemersky, I practiced that. I'm not sure if I got that right. Um, uh, Bob Root Bernstein and uh, Douglas Noonan. They're going to be speaking in turn. I invite um, uh, Professor Wisemersky to come up first, and then we'll have a uh, discussion afterwards. Thank you.
Good morning. Um, uh, I, I need to start with a disclaimer. This is not an economic analysis. Okay, I'm far away enough now. <laughs> Closer, okay. Um, this is not an economic analysis. Um, I'm really a pol political policy analyst. And that means that for me, I can tr often consider economic factors as kind of background or antecedent variables. And that's really what I've done. I've taken the sort of new growth economy as a, a part of the change from the industrial welfare state to the new growth competition state. Uh, since at, when you're formulating public policy, you need to take into account both of those things as well as the policy area or content that you're taking into account. Now, this, my, I got interested in this question from a couple of different areas. Uh, one, when uh, Mark Rushton put out a call for this conference, I looked at that and said, hmm, how do I connect this through one of the major policy frameworks that um, I know, which is John Kingdon's multiple streams and policy windows? There, where does the economics come into that model? Uh, and then one of my students was doing work on small arts organizations, okay, actually the smallest of the small. And we spent a lot of time trying to define what small meant in this context. And we also discovered that even though we knew that this was a large part of the local creative economies, when we looked at it in the context of Columbus and in the context of Ohio, we really were finding that what we considered micro enterprises, up to five employees, uh, was between, was basically 83% of the creative industries in the city and in the state. All right, now just think about that for a second in terms of where we have tended to put our focus, which is on our arts organizations that are above that size, and that's 13% of the totality. Now, of course, in ec for economics, they're looking at the larger economic impact that that middle and big range of institutions and organizations are concerned with. But we also know that the arts industry is a kind of unique industry in the way it focuses on its small, self-employed, um, independent workers basically as the core of their entire sector, all right? And so that is often as 40% of a city or it may be uh, this more like an 80% of a city's creative um, context. Um, all right, and we also then started with the third element, which is if this is the creative core of the um, arts sector, that individual artists are, we can't get to them by policy, at least not national policy much anymore. We can still do it at the local level, we can do it at the state level, but there are difficulties in reaching individual artists in an effective way. Um, so I wondered whether or not changing the political economic context from the industrial welfare state to the new economy competition model opens new opportunities for policy innovation concerning the issue of public support for artists. Now, in order to do this, we, as I said, we mentioned, I mentioned using Kingdon. All right, now, where does economics fit into this? He has a problem stream, which might have an economic component. He has a solution stream, which always has economic feasibility in, built into it. Um, and he has a political stream, and the political stream tends to be the uh, catalyst for change. Well, I kind of backed this up and said, okay, the political actors in the political stream actually uh, channel changes in the economic context, economic assumptions, as part of the public mood that he talks about. So they become sort of the carriers of economic ideas and changes into this whole policy uh, creation stream. If you also look at the new economy, you know, if you only take Romer's uh, definition of this as taking existing activities and resources and using them in a different way, in some way that's a classic definition of an entrepreneur. Now, the business sector uses entrepreneurs as creating new ventures or new firms, all right? But there's a much broader literature that talks about entrepreneurship as kind of recombining things in interesting and different ways to create new niches or new opportunities. So if you take the broader sense of this, then we really then have a connection to entrepreneurship. All right, and finally, okay, remember the three streams of, of um, Kingdon. 
there's a supposed connection between the way the problem is defined and the kinds of solutions that you start looking at. All right, so you're going to hear from a lot of other speakers at this conference, you've heard from some of them already, that there are linkages uh, in this issue definition stream that says when we look at the arts, Sometimes we look at them in the context of creative and cultural industry. Sometimes we look at them in terms of city economic development and creative cities. Sometimes we use it as a factor in small business development. It's a factor in the competition state at the local, internal level, where the competition state model is typically used internationally. It's involved in career development for artists. It's a part of arts entrepreneurship, and of course, it is part of the creative class. And as you've also seen so far, mo many of our speakers are not going to be really talking about individual artists as their unit of analysis. They're either combining the whole sector or they're primarily looking at arts organizations. So this sort of addresses a sort of gap in a lot of the other approaches. But if you look at just this, okay, your key words are, all right, there are a number of ways in which we're already defining individual artists or arts-based entrepreneurs as part of the city new growth model. It's a matter of artists and supporting creativity. It's a matter of local consumption and city development. It's a matter of small business development and urban affairs. It's a matter of the creative class. So that's at least four different ways in which the issue can be framed. And I would argue that by solving the first one or paying attention to the first one about the arts, and supporting artists as a way of supporting creativity, you have the option of creating a policy solution that is arts policy, connects to city development policy, connects to labor policy. And therefore, we have a solution that might hit on three different political bases. Now, I'm not going to speak through these at great length. I just put them there to kind of give you some sense of how our thinking might change if we said, okay, how did we think about things in the industrial welfare state? And how does that translate into how we thought about the arts at the same period? All right, and what, you know, here you can see many of the things that we've already seen sort of begin to happen. Um, as we just transferred the industrial welfare state to the patron state. All right, this one takes the new economy assumptions and tries to translate them into cultural policy assumptions. All right, notice here that one of the first elements is entrepreneurial as opposed to a decentralized style. All right, and again, I think that is the nature of the new economy. It already directs us towards an entrepreneurial set of options. But you'll also see that the rise of the creative class fits here. The emphasis on localism and creative cities fits here. The creative industries perspective fits here. Um, and we'll come back to the issue of the emphasis on public value fits here. Now, one other comparison I want you to keep in mind, and that's under the old industrial welfare state. The way we thought about policy concerning arts organizations was in many ways significantly different than how we thought about artists. All right, and there are two things I want you to take out of this. One is that as a matter of industrial welfare policy, we thought of the development of arts organizations largely as a matter of both managerial excellence and uh, managerial competence and artistic excellence, two dimensions of um, quality. All right, when we looked at the, the paradigm for individual artists, we see only one of those dimensions. There is no mention of de uh, de defining or developing uh, managerial co uh, competence. All right, it's all on artistic development. All right, professionalism is largely developed as artistic competence. And there's also a great emphasis on the organizational model for developing relationships between the organizations and their markets and audiences. There is no such emphasis when you talk about individual artists. So we have to say we're dealing with two different models at the industrial welfare state, which means we probably also or should expect two different models when we move into the new competition state. One last sort of piece of, well, two more pieces of 
models, okay, because I'm putting together lots of different models in this context of Kingdon to try to figure out really what I am looking for as the markers or the hallmarks of potential policy options. All right, so in Investing in Creativity, a study done in 2003 by a consortium of foundations about how to respond to the inability to fund artists nationally as a matter of fellowships, all right, they looked at sort of, well, what do artists need actually to prosper? And we can see that in the old industrial welfare state, we tended to focus on the first three attributes, validation, markets, and material supports, which often meant space or money. What we didn't spend as much time on was training and professional development, uh, or professional development was limited really to artistic professional development, communities and network building, and information. In many ways, you can say this is the infrastructure part of supporting artists. So that gives me another element that says, well, maybe that's something we need to address in the new economy. And finally, there's some interesting work done by Tremblay in Canada where she's talked about sort of creative risk. And we know that risk is a factor across the creative sector. It's one of the unifying factors between the commercial sector, the nonprofit sector, the informal sector. Well, she says that art is really about three kinds of risk. The uncertainty of creation, the uncertainty of consumption, both of which we're familiar with. You know, the difficulty of knowing whether an artwork will find an audience, whether it'll find an audience in the lifetime of that artist, uh, whether the work will uh, get uh, professional acceptance. But she adds in also career risk. And since we know that artists often move from different parts of the sector to other parts of the sector, that they often put together careers and employment by piecing together projects or moving from different kinds of organizations, career management, okay, if you want to be entrepreneurs of your own career, tend to be one of the factors that we don't quite look at uh, or focus on in terms of policy. So I put all these things together. And I started to say, all right, I'm first directed towards entrepreneurship. Well, there is a set of entrepreneurs in the arts that exist. So instead of doing a mathematical experiment, I'm sort of searching the field for uh, prototypes, models that might sort of address this question and see how they're working when they're being adopted. All right, now, an artisan is a person who has a skill in the applied arts, as a craftsman, high quality, distinctive products, small quantities, and often sort of handmade or traditionally made. Um, more recently, we've taken some of the traditional pieces out of it, kept the small production scale, the sort of flexible informal organization which characterizes these micro enterprises, uh, professional skills and idea. Professional is really in the making and in the skills, not necessarily in sort of certain kinds of acclimation or validation. All right, and then you put this together with entrepreneur. All right, and so this is finding new and innovative ways to take advantage of opportunity without the assurance of success, and this is the rat risk factor. So we basically said, let's call these arts-based entrepreneurs. Now, we thought of thinking of them as artisans, but that runs into problems when you talk about the arts. Because an artisan in most other areas of the economy really is somebody who takes a mass-produced product sort of customizes it, boutiques it, okay? So you have artisan bread, and you have artisan coffee, and you have artisan food, all right? Um, so that by taking the small scale and the value added of creativity to it, you're trying to actually increase the status of the good. In the arts, you start with something that has a high value added element of creativity, what you're trying to do is assist the business reach and market reach of those kinds of activities. So we decided artists and carried too much baggage, we went back to arts entrepreneur. Now, not all arts entrepreneurs are the same thing, all right? And a number of times you read that on the one hand, um, the arts require great nuance. But on the other hand, we tend to try to cluster arts information as broadly as possible so we can get a large data set. 
All right. My starting assumption is that that hides an awful lot of differences and that this, we're going to need a much more nuanced set of policy options. So I'm going to focus on the first two kinds of entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs and cultural entrepreneurs. Okay, they're both art-based. Creative entrepreneurs are based on creative innovation. They're the creating current artists. All right, cultural entrepreneurs are people who tend to base uh, their creative assets are cultural, their heritage assets. So that when we say craftsmen, we're often talking about folk arts. We're talking about handmade art and crafts. That's where cultural entrepreneurs happen. All right, and if you look at the, the sort of range of things in the, um, the atmosphere, we're seeing that foundations are trying to address this, often through local projects. You've got cultural entrepreneurs showing up all over the place that have gotten public support but haven't quite sort of reached a critical mass. If you look at micro entrepreneurs, they're not even the same kind. And... We, I want to end with a couple of major questions, okay, and I'll be wrapping up right there. Okay, first, uh, there's a structural option. There's a structural problem. Uh, typically, we can only reach policy through nonprofit organizations or state entities. Individuals don't fit that. How do we get around the, org the literally formal organizational problem? Second, capacity building. This is capacity that really needs to be built organizationally, as though you were treating them as a micro-organization. And third, there is the question of moving them into the digital networked environment, where using social media for a lot of management processes like fundraising, like um, marketing, is going to come through uh, digital techniques for them. And lastly, and perhaps one of the biggest questions, is how do you get the arts policy community to feel comfortable with this idea? A lot of artists will simply not consider themselves entrepreneurs, nor want to be entrepreneurial. And yet, if you actually look at a lot of what they're doing and what's working, they're in fact acting as entrepreneurs. So I would sort of suggest that this is sort of one of the primary places to look for a policy option in the new economy for supporting the core of creative activity. Um, and then there's a lot of development that still has to go into that in terms of feasibility on a number of different scales to see what it, whether it'll match. Thank you. Good morning. Many thanks to the organizers for inviting me here today, and I also want to thank uh, my research collaborators at Michigan State University, Rex Lamore and John Schweitzer of the Center for Community Economic Development, uh, Eileen Warbach, James Lawton, and Michelle Root Bernstein of the College of Arts and Letters, uh, and Amber Peruski and Megan Van Dyke of the MSU Honors College who are here in the audience today. In the rise of the creative class, Richard Florida suggests that high-tech innovators and artists tend to congregate in the same geographical locales. Why would such a relationship exist? We propose that arts-rich communities and high-tech entrepreneurial activity may coexist in part because the science, technology, engineering, and mathematically trained individuals, or what I'm going to call STEM professionals, who found high-tech companies also participate in the arts, and they do so because they perceive arts and crafts to be valuable contributors to their personal and professional creative capacity. An important variable that we explore that's often left out of economic models is the effect of both formal and informal arts and crafts education on this relationship. The hypothesis that entrepreneurial innovators, by which we mean individuals who successfully bring an invention to market, are highly likely to be in, uh, personally engaged in arts and crafts, originated from studies of eminent scientists. A variety of studies dating back as far as 1878 demonstrates that participation in arts and crafts strongly correlates with scientific success. For example, Nobel Prize winners have about three times as many adult avocations as the average scientist, represented here by the Sigma Xi data, or 
a typical member of the American public as determined by NEA surveys. The Nobel laureates are between 15 and 25 times as likely as the average scientist to engage as an adult in fine arts such as painting, sculpting, printmaking, crafts such as woodworking and metalworking, performance arts such as acting and dancing, and creative writing or poetry. In addition to these statistical correlations, I have documented in many of my publications the ways in which eminent scientists benefit from their avocations through skill development, knowledge, concepts, methods, and a simple understanding of the creative process itself. These studies provide the impetus to investigate whether a similar uh, link exists between arts and crafts participation and economic measures of entrepreneurial innovation such as patent production, copyrights, and the founding of new companies, among other groups of STEM professionals. In the first place, we gathered data on the reported lifetime participation in various arts and crafts explored by Michigan State University Honors College graduates who had majored in a STEM subject between 1990 and 1995 and went into a STEM field. We compared these with the data on the lifetime participation of US public as determined by a 2008 National Endowment for the Arts survey. Participation by the MSU Honor STEM graduates is statistically significantly higher than the public in every category, lending credence to the hypothesis that STEM innovators may be attracted to and to even to help build arts-rich communities because of their personal proclivities, their values, and their experiences. We've also surveyed the members of the National Academy of Engineering, the NAE, who have arts and crafts participation profiles similar, though certainly not identical, to those of Nobel Prize winners and the MSU Honors College STEM graduates. NAE members are much more likely than the average American to participate as an adult in photography, to have uh, crafts avocations such as woodworking and metalworking, glass blowing and mechanics, to draw and to paint, and to play music. Notably, a random sampling of university engineering faculty have virtually identical avocational profiles as the NAE members, and these data again suggest an unusual degree of participation by engineers in a variety of arts and crafts. We've also found that there's a strong correlation between lifetime arts and crafts participation and those scientists and engineers who produce the most intellectual property in the form of patents, copyrights, and new companies founded. National Academy of Engineering respondents were divided into those with five or less patents and those with more than five patents. Statistically significant positive correlations with patent production were found for sustained participation from childhood through mature adulthood in photography, music, which included playing an instrument, composing or singing, crafts, electronics, computing, and writing both creative and nonfiction. Negative correlations were found for fabric arts and performing arts such as dancing, uh, acting, and theater. Uh, these were practiced mainly by women in the members of the NAE uh, who had also the least production of intellectual property. We're not entirely sure why, but within that group itself, uh, however, the practice of fabric arts and performing arts is not counterproductive to the public uh, production of intellectual property. We also compared the sustained avocations of Michigan engineering faculty, some of whom had found, or none of whom had founded a company, with awardees of the highly competitive Michigan Economic Development Corporation fund, uh, funders, uh, fundees uh, who are explicitly awarded the money to found new companies. Positive significant differences correlate sustained participation in fine arts, such as drawing, painting, and printmaking, the crafts, woodworking, metalworking, mechanics, and glass again, and performing arts such as dancing, acting, and theater with founding new high-tech companies. Finally, sustained arts and crafts participation by MSU Honors STEM graduates also correlates well with the production of intellectual property, such as patents, copyrights, and companies. While there's a general trend towards participation in all arts and crafts, save for music, being higher among those who produce patents and found new companies than among those who do not, and at every stage of life, 
sustained participation from childhood through mature adulthood in five arts and crafts shown here were highly significant. Photography, woodwork, mechanics, electronics, and dancing. Inventors and innovators tend to be people who work with their hands and their bodies as well as their minds over a lifetime. Now, correlation, of course, is not causation. So to move beyond mere statistics, we also asked all of the groups who we looked at, this was a total of 225 individuals, does your avocation or hobby or the skills, knowledge, aesthetic, social contacts, creative practices, or just plain perseverance that you've gained from it play any role in your current vocation? As this figure shows, an average of about 65% of the members of every group stated that there were direct links between their vocation and their avocation. Typical responses included the following. I use some of my skills from drawing to create stimuli for experiments. Experience with visual composition helps to create good diagrams and presentations. Quilting is a great, great way of using creativity and analytical thinking to solve problems and create something that is aesthetically appealing. It improves my creativity in my current vocation. Mechanical and material properties I learned in my hobbies can often relate to mechanical and material issues in microelectronics, especially in my specific discipline. Paper folding and wood blocks gave me early insight into 3D geometry, which is critical to my work. All of these groups were also asked, would you recommend arts and crafts education as a useful or even essential background for a scientific innovator? Surprisingly, 80% of the members of every surveyed group responded yes. Again, typical responses provide some insight into why. Yes, ability to make simple prototypes and models with my own hands is vital for creativity in product design. Mechanical skills are important for constructing experimental apparatus. Pattern visualization is very important and is developed by my arts and crafts. Yes, I think moving around, dancing, playing on the playground helps one get a visceral feeling for physics. Or simply, yes, it improves creativity. In short, these scientists and engineers report the same types of connections between their arts and crafts training and their professional ability that Nobel laureates, who I've studied previously, reported. The high regard successful STEM professionals have for their arts is validated by formal controlled studies demonstrating uh, that one of the best correlates of success in any STEM subject is visual thinking ability. The simple intervention of a drawing or painting class can dramatically improve success of underperforming students in STEM subjects, and so some of the connections between arts and crafts STEM ability which are asserted on the basis of personal experience and observation by our interviewees and surveyed individuals have a basis in formal scientific studies. We've also employed both our statistical study and free response questions to investigate whether there are particular arts or crafts experiences at particular times during a scientist's or engineer's life that are especially important for developing particular skills, knowledge, or processes appropriate to stimulating STEM innovation and entrepreneurship. We have thus far failed to identify any specific indicators. Only four findings regarding arts and crafts experiences have thus far withstood our repeated inspection of the data. One is that formal arts education is no more important than private lessons, informal mentoring, or self-learning. Another is that arts and crafts that require significant innovative practice correlated with entrepreneurial outcomes better than ones that tend to involve mainly following instructions. So for example, composing music rather than simply playing an instrument. Third, while mature avocations are a good correlate for innovation and entrepreneurship, even better one is the practice of one or more arts and crafts sustained from childhood through mature adulthood. Transient or late exposure to arts and crafts does not appear to be nearly as effective as long-term mastery. Our fourth finding is that the probability of pursuing an avocation as an adult, which is our best correlate of innovativeness, is dependent to a very strong degree on being introduced to that avocation as a child. 
This figure compares the rates at which two groups of adult STEM professionals participate in various arts and crafts. One group, the tall bars, were introduced to that avocation as a child. The other group, the short bars, took up their avocation for the first time as an adult. Clearly, the probability that a STEM professional will have one or more arts and crafts avocation is highly dependent on having consistent access to arts and crafts training materials and institutions throughout their lives. Since adult and sustained participation in arts and crafts are the best correlates of STEM innovation and entrepreneurship, early introduction, sustained ability, and adult participation are critically important. We draw a number of tentative conclusions from our studies thus far. The most important is that the connections between arts and entrepreneurial innovation are a complex system of interactions that cannot be modeled using any simple cause and effect methodology. Included in this web of interactions are arts, crafts, formal education systems, informal education systems, private and individual mentors, cultural institutions, established businesses, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, the intellectual property that they invent and invest in, and the new companies that are founded. The system is centered on and mediated by individual STEM professionals and the interests and values that they develop doing their work and then bring to their communities. Now there's no doubt from our results that the arts and crafts knowledge, whether acquired through formal or informal education means is very important to STEM innovators and the persistent experience with arts and crafts correlate strongly with economically important measures of entrepreneurship. Arts and crafts are therefore valuable to the development and training of STEM innovators. Our results suggest equally that because STEM innovators highly value arts and crafts, the system of interactions is going to be uh, forward and backward. What this perhaps is most important for this system is that the STEM businesses within an emerging knowledge economy uh, are, have reciprocal interactions in the places at which they are located. The arts experience that a child has in school or at home in a cultural institution determine to a large extent that whether that child will become and stay involved with the art or craft long enough to actually master the lessons and apply it to their STEM entrepreneurship. STEM professionals, in short, can mediate both arts and high-tech development in the same communities because they are both scientists and artists themselves all at one time. We therefore pr uh, propose that STEM professionals not only draw upon the arts, pun intended, to develop their uh, developmental uh, entrepreneurial innovations, but also that they repay this debt by reinvesting in the arts and crafts uh, institutions and educational systems in a robust degree. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Good morning. I'm Doug Noonan. Uh, this is going to be reporting on some research I've done with a colleague of mine at Georgia Tech, uh, Sherry Bresnitz. We're going to be looking at arts districts the role of universities and media arts, and the main questions we're looking at here is trying to identify the impacts of cultural districts and major research universities on economic growth locally in terms of jobs and innovation in particular, and in particular in the media arts uh, sector. So the sort of more narrow questions we want to answer with this research is looking at how media arts employment and innovation differs uh, from overall employment and innovation in a city whether that city has or does not have an arts or cultural district or whether or not that city has a number of major research universities or not. And we also want to look at the trends in employment and the trends in innovation uh, in media arts and whether those differ or how they differ between cities with and without arts districts and with and without research universities. And then we're also kind of interested in the interaction effect or the combination of having both universities and uh, arts districts and whether you get something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts in terms of media arts employment and innovation. 
Uh, and the bottom line we'll, we'll end up seeing here is that arts districts have consistently stronger and positive impacts on arts and media arts related innovation, whereas universities seem to be promoting arts and media arts related employment, uh, which ties nicely into the talk we just saw. And interestingly for the university's effect, it seems to be occurring in the broader urban area rather than in the city of the universities itself. Uh, so the, this is old slides, all right, so the, uh, the background on a lot of this research doesn't need to go in, I don't need to go into much detail on it. It's, it's building off of stuff we've already talked about this morning, where there's a lot of work that's been done already on sort of direct income and direct impacts of uh, local arts institutions and artists themselves on the region's exporting base or on the ability to draw in outside funding and visitors bringing cash and, and economic activity into a region. And then more recently we've been seeing uh, sort of this creative class style arguments where we see some more indirect effects of arts and art, arts industries on bringing high level human capital uh, and certain f types of high tech firms and other likes into, the, into a region's economy uh, and sort of diversifying and, and, and altering the uh, composition of, of that uh, local economic base. Uh, and I want to try to marry that literature with another bit of re research that's quite separate uh, from a lot of the work on arts policy and cultural economics, and that's look, looking at universities as drivers of local innovation uh, and the spillovers that come out of major research universities on local economies. And it's been established that universities are very important sources in, in, of new knowledge and technology, and a lot of that emphasis goes into tech transfer and how we measure the output of universities and the contributions in terms of tech commercializing new technologies coming out of universities. And increasingly, universities are under some pressure to be making contributions to societies, and often in that and especially their local economic regions and more and more that's seen as through research and development activities uh, in particular through tech transfer with industry but I think we were under appreciating a lot of the uh, services and activities going on at universities that aren't as easily quantified as some of that tech transfer and raises some interesting questions about sort of other public service roles of universities and their impact on on local economies and and some of this, you know, the creative class style argument picks up and that universities are more than just about technology generation. They're also doing a lot with generating talent or attracting talent and doing stuff with tolerance that we've seen in the earlier talks. So what I want to try to do is bring in sort of the arts contributions, the potential arts contributions of major research universities uh, and, and see how they're going to affect uh, our understanding of arts in a, in a local economic growth uh, setting. And, and I want to focus on the media arts as an interesting intersection between the high tech and the artistic creation, uh, sort of bringing in that creative class style uh, vocations and industries al along with more conventional university activities, where something that has fairly important links straight back to universities as well and university education and research as well as to something like arts districts. Uh, and I'm not just looking at media arts in this, in this work, we're also looking more traditional arts related occupations and industries, partly just for contrast purposes. So what, what do I mean by media arts? Uh, here we're looking at artistic and creative content in new and especially digital formats and forms, uh, digital art, computerized animation, interaction, interactive art, internet art, uh, and we're going to classify a lot of these arts by looking at different uh, very inclusive definitions for occupation and industry codes and patent classifications. Uh, there's a lot of emerging industries or thought, industries thought to be growing quite rapidly that overlap with this media arts notion. We want to see is, is this being driven at all by arts districts or universities. The data we use for all of this, uh, our unit of observation, we're gonna be looking at city level uh, data here. We take the 100 most populous cities in the US and we're gonna see based on a, an old list of cities that had about 89 cities that had arts or cultural districts inside them. Uh, about, and then we take, uh, there's a number of cities on this list that weren't in the top 100 most populous cities. So we add those cities in as well. We're left with about 150 cities. Roughly half of these things have an arts or cultural district. And then we're also going to look at the presence of research extensive R1 universities in those cities, so the number of R1, R1s in the city, uh, and also in the core based statistical area. So a little bit broader notion of, of the metropolitan area, also including some smaller towns. Uh, and then we're going to match into this data set off uh, patent data where we're matching the patent assignee, the inventor, to the city uh, that they list as, as um, their residence. And throughout a lot of this, the notion of uh, 
innovations, I'm using essentially synonymously with patenting activity, which is a, uh, sort of obviously a very limited notion of what we mean by innovation. Uh, but it does have an advantage in that it ties pretty directly back to the more broader literature on innovation and university-led innovation, which heavily focuses on patents and patent data. Uh, and then my employment data is coming from the uh, current population survey, which we're matching to the metro area. Uh, of the respondent looking at their first or second jobs uh, as available. All right, so the method we use here, it's a basic OLS regression approach where we're gonna think about whether you have an arts district or not or whether you've got a number of R1 universities as the treatment. So we just think about treatment and effect. What's the effect of uh, having this sort of treatment? And we're looking at the effect on employment and innovation. We're looking at both of these notions as shares of overall employment or shares of overall innovation. So we're essentially implicitly going to be controlling for overall socks, shocks to the size of the local economy. If employment as a whole goes up or down, we're not that interested in it. What we're interested in is, is the sort of inten arts intensity or media arts intensity of that employment going up or down? Is the rate of patenting in media arts relative to rates of patenting more generally going up or down. And we're going to look at whether or not those uh, shares are higher or lower in cities with or without this treatment. We're also going to look at the trends. So we want to see uh, are the trends in these shares going up or down differentially based on whether or not you've got research universities or arts districts. And the nice part about this is it's going to help us at least uh, in a sense, control for the possibility that there might be something special in the first place about these cities that have arts districts or major research universities. And by looking at trends, if there's sort of this chicken and egg problem, then it's not arts intensive employment uh, that's a result of the arts district, but because you've got a lot of artists in town, that's why you got the arts district. Uh, after the fact, we're going to be looking at trends following the establishment of these arts districts or establishment of these universities and see if the paths are diverge in any way. And, and one thing we did find in looking through all of this, and that if you go back to say 1990 data, cities that have high intensity uh, concentration in arts or media arts employment don't seem to be any more or less likely to have an arts district in them come the year 2000. Um, districts don't seem to be drawn to arts intensive cities, um, at least according to that list. So the results we gave you sort of a collage of results, a lot of different statistical uh, models that have been estimated. I'm going to go through some of the results and we, these results show up in four main ways. We're looking at employment shares circa 2006 where we're looking at four different measures of employments. Two for arts related employment, two for media arts related employment, one's employment in arts occupations and one's employment in arts related industries and the same for media arts. Then we're looking at those same things, not just the level of employment in 2006, but the trends from 99, from 99 to 2011. And then we have a pair of results, one looking at patenting, and then the trends in patenting as well. Patenting data only goes up to 2006. And we're looking at the total number of patents, and I'm more interested in the share of overall patents that are going to media arts. So results that we find, uh, Arts districts seem to be leading to uh, an increase or higher levels of arts and media arts employment. The baseline here, we're looking at about 2.5% of the employment base and arts or media arts employment. Uh, and we're looking at an increase of about half a percent, so up to about 3%. So a small effect, but off a small base, it's actually relatively large. Having more R1 universities in the city doesn't have any impact on employment. But if we look at the more broad notion, more broader definition in the urban area, we see that more R1s in the urban area does lead to a significant increase in arts and media arts related employment. Uh, and, and interesting, when we switch to looking at this in terms of trends, uh, the effect of arts districts on the trends in arts employment disappears. And there isn't a, a stable effect of arts districts on increasing uh, intensity of arts employment uh, within the city. Whereas the R1s, the number of universities there has a persistent effect and an increasing trend. So we see a modest impact off a base of about a 1% growth over the last decade in arts or media arts related employment, about a tenth of a percent increase for every R1 you have in your CBSA. And the, as far as an interaction effect is the whole greater than the sum of the parts, and we see there's no evidence of this, these things, uh, there's no positive or negative interaction effect uh, going on there. With respect to more the innovation or patenting side of things, having more arts districts shows it up as an increasing rate of media arts patenting in, in 2006. But the, Average city uh, patenting rate for media arts is roughly double that if you have an arts district in town. Having more R1s in town had no impact on the share of media arts patenting. Now, having more R1s in town led to more patenting in the city overall, but not a differential impact on the share of those patents that are going to media arts. Uh, and if you look at just raw counts of patents, 
Each additional R1 in the city is associated with about five additional media arts patents per year. Uh, having an, an arts district in town, another additional five patents in media arts related fields per year. Having both of them is an additional on top of both that ten, plus 10 there. Having both of them, we get you another four. So there does seem to be an interaction effect there uh, with respect to innovation. Having both of those things does better in terms of the raw counts of patents. But if we look at this in terms of trends, not just that level of total amount of patenting, but the rate of increase of media arts patenting of, as a whole composition of patents, the sh increasing rates of media arts patenting as a share of all overall patenting is actually a steeper trajectory in cities that have arts and cultural districts in them. In fact, the growth rate in media arts patenting is three times larger in cities that have arts districts than those that don't. Uh, the count of R1 universities in that town, whether it's in the broader metro area or in the city itself, seems to have no impact on the change in the trends in share of patenting going on, and there's no interaction effect going on in the trends side of the story. So the main conclusions for all of this, R1 universities in the urban areas seem to lead to an increase in media arts employment, shares, and trends. Having more R1s in the same city has no impact on media arts employment. Uh, but having, and having more arts district, having an arts district in town seems to lead to an increase in media arts employment between 1999 and 2006. But if we look at a broader uh, time span, say from 1990 to 2010 or 2011, then that effect of arts districts on employment disappears. And it's a very transitory effect that, we're, that is, I wouldn't say is stable in the data. So on the innovation side of things, uh, it's a little bit simpler story. Cultural districts are associated with much higher media, at, media arts patenting, both in shares in, in 2006 as well as trends leading up to then, when R1 universities don't seem to have a differential uh, impact. Presence of these things doesn't seem to affect the media arts patenting rates in any given city. So sort of our bottom lines here ends up being a little bit unintuitive and that our sort of naive expectations going into this, especially if we believe a lot of the hype we read, it's arts districts are going to be great for local employment and help boost local employment in arts-related fields, and universities are good for innovation, so they're going to help lead to more patenting. And what we end up finding is almost the opposite of this, and that cultural districts are the ones that seem to be promoting innovation, at least in media arts-related fields. Uh, it's consistent with a clustering of sort of creative entrepreneurial types in media arts around or in cities that have uh, arts and cultural districts. And these things don't, cultural districts don't seem to be a, the location for arts or media arts related employment intensity. Uh, whereas R1s, more research intensive universities seem to be promoting the arts and media arts related employment. They are the ones who are attracting and training labor for nearby arts districts, whether they're actually sort of STEM researchers or artists themselves, I, I am not distinguishing, but it's consistent with the story that R1 universities are more attracting and, and creating the labor supply in the arts rather than actually the innovation and the patenting for it. Uh, they are doing that, but not anything more or less than patenting in other, in other fields. So I think there's some interesting puzzles that come out of this. Uh, we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, whether we're going to be looking at some more case studies on this uh, and getting to know some of the sort of top and, and bottom performing cities. We want to break down and look into cities. There's a lot of within city uh, variation and these districts can be quite small. So what's going on within a, within a city around these districts to get more localized effects. Uh, and then we want to also be looking at what's, what are the universities themselves actually doing in terms of producing this labor supply or, or are they just attracting it? Uh, are, what's the effect of different arts programs or arts departments at universities in, in terms of creating this kind of talent? But that's all future work. We're stuck with what we have right now. Thank you. Um, so I want to, I, I used up some of my comments, um, uh, some time for comments up front, so I didn't want to move to questioning uh, very uh, quickly, especially from the audience, but I did want to uh, quickly just uh, lead off of one, uh, with one question to the, to the panel, and then um, as the microphones come around, I'll, you know, may, I want to get to uh, the audience uh, very quickly. Um, so uh, for the panel, I am... Um, uh, <laughs> There's been a lot of uh, emphasis w with the with the creation of the digital economy, right? This is this is really um, 
been incredible for the individual access to works of art, to music, to whatever, across the country, across the globe. It's a technological change that's changed access to, uh, to, to the arts amongst, you know, along with uh, other types of information. Um, uh, at the same time, there's been an emphasis on uh, localization across a lot of different areas of the economy, uh, including you know, local foods, uh, uh, but, but also with um, uh, local um, arts performances and so forth. To, so I, was, I wanted to ask a general question for, for the panel. To what extent do you see these as, in some sense, in competition with one another um, versus um, uh, being complementary? Right? So there's these, these kinds of tensions. Um, and uh, I know that, uh, Margaret, in, in, in your work in, in looking at that, you, know, you emphasize the use of kind of social networking right? in, in terms of, um, of helping entrepreneurs. But uh, to what extent, in some sense, is this access to, to, to these networks diminishing the demand for some of these local, um, this, this localization effect? So I want to kind of a general, you know, anyone on the panel wants to respond to that, and then we can get to some questions from the audience. Well, I'll sort of take a little bit of that with um, people at, at, operating at the very small micro enterprise level in the arts tend to really replace a lot of what might be organizational marketing, fundraising by using social networks. And in, in terms of fundraising, that often allows them access to a broader network than local. But in terms of marketing, it tends to allow them to reach local audiences much more cheaply because they really rely on word of mouth through social network for that. Uh, and they will go to Kickstarter or other kinds of crowdsourcing for the fundraising. So I think it may vary depending on what kind of function you, you're using the social network and the network to, uh, what technology to sort of do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think one of the problems we have to think about is consumerism versus actively participating mm -hmm. um, and what the difference is in terms of skills, knowledge, and so forth that you generate. Um, Certainly, my wife and I, for example, just went to a concert uh, in, in Lansing, and we were, there were only two people in the audience younger than we were. Uh, that's really frightening, because that, that means that, that basically, uh, although people may be able to listen uh, on their iPod or whatever it happens to be to, to great classical music played by the best people, um, the number of venues for performers now becomes very small. The number of people attending those venues becomes very small. Um, and certainly when we're, we're looking at students and their access to being able to play an instrument, they may hear this, they may be able to get it very cheaply from uh, iTunes, but do they actually translate that into active participation in any way? And then do they invest their money later on in the cultural institutions? You could have a great symphony but if your uh, young people don't know what classical music is, don't care about classical music, have never played an instrument, can they, can they understand or participate in it? Right, and, and it's then, a big then, difference, course, as you point out. There's the whole issue that, that we're looking at. Um, if they don't develop those skills, then right. we have no way to, to transfer them into right. to other fields and, and get the innovations at all. So. Right, right. Yeah, I think, it, I think these are all really big and important interest for the field as a whole and how much of the sort of arts consumption needs, it needs to be in a specific place and how, how much of a substitution, sort of how much of a loss is it to listen to the concert as you're walking down the street versus actually being at the venue and seeing live performance. I think that's a, it's an increasing challenge and an important one in the field. But I also think that's on the consumption side and the production side is also very interesting where how much do you actually need to be there in some place to be able to produce the arts? or produce the culture instead of just putting it up as a YouTube video and letting it go. And the substitutability of place in, in the production process is a big one. And if there is a role for being at the place to be able to produce, you have to show up to the office or wherever, then I think what we see are these kinds of uh, localization effects are still going to be very strong because you want to have a somewhat thicker labor market so that you have other options for potential employers or potential ways to make money if you're in one of these sort of clusters in a bigger city. And so you'll, you, you'll see that, I think, in the long run in a lot of fields, but it might be shrinking. Right, right. And so it's a good distinction between the production um, and the, the consumption side because, because you know, the, the, you know as, as you've shown, there's... Uh, there's a difference between these people being involved actually in um, uh, the arts versus just sort of uh, as a as a um, observer. Yeah, we're also a little bit worried about 
uh, the geography and timing of all this. I mean, if you think about our data, we're looking at people uh, surveying them, say, 30 years after right. uh, they were introduced and, say, played their instrument, made their art and so forth, or got their education, whether formal or informal. Uh, so they could have gotten it in a little town in, in, in Idaho right. uh, and now be working in Silicon Valley. Right. Uh, the Idaho could have been the critical factor for them, and I'm not sure how we actually picked that up uh, economically or, or, or any other way. Right. Um, another complication. All right. Uh, I think there were some uh, questions out here. Let's go over here first. And then... Hi. This is just a general point. I fully agree with your earlier statement that GDP per capita is not a measure of happiness, and it shouldn't be, but I'd like to defend GDP per capita a little bit. Uh, you said that we don't measure the value of prices going down. That's in the real price index, and generally people do look at that when they're comparing countries across time because, of course, prices are higher than 1929, but also, even adjusting for price, GDP per capita is higher. Thank you. No, I, I, there, there, are, there are different ways of... Um... Hi, I'm Rachel Soloveitchik from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is why... <laughs> There's certainly ways that we can get that in there. And I will say that money, money won't buy happiness, but it doesn't hurt either. So, you know, I'm happy to say that. Uh, we have a question right here. Hi, uh, Pamela Jennings from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I had a question about the R1 um, research. Um, very interesting uh, statistics you have there. But I was wondering whether you're looking at also the um, politics of access to the ability of certain disciplines and departments to actually get the resources, the mentoring, um, to be able to actually push their inventions forward for patents at research universities and whether or not you're also looking at the phenomenon, particularly in the media arts, digital media arts, of people um, who are actually starting to go into disciplines and align themselves with disciplines where they can get the resources that they need to do their work. Yeah, I think that's a great issue. Good, 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 at least comment. I'm not sure if I can answer the question part on that. Uh, and that we, we haven't broken down stuff too much yet. And, and one of the things we're going to do is, is look at the composition of those R1s and the presence of those programs. Uh, and it'll be crude at best, but it'll be a, better than what we've done so far. And it'll be a start to see uh, how much is it the presence of these sort of more obviously arts-related programs driving this versus people who are actually going outside of the arts and getting their computer science degree in order to later go and, and help make some video game content. So it's fundamentally very creative and artistic. within the research universities if they are open to actually talking with people from the arts programs in terms of giving them the resources needed to push the patents or their innovation through. Yeah, we're, we're not looking at that. I'm not sure that there's a great deal of variance uh, across R1s or cities or universities. There might be very little of that communication going on and might be fairly homogenous everywhere. <laughs> I come from a tech school uh, that if it had an arts program, we would make it an official policy to not speak to them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, we wouldn't share resources. Hi, my name is Joan Jeffrey. I'm the director of the Research Center for Arts and Culture at the National Center for Creative Aging. Professor Ruth Bernstein, my question is for you. Some very, very interesting work, and I'm wondering if you've noticed it went by so fast. I hope this is correct. but. Um, that it looks like some of the participation by the STEM people um, are in greater art, greater in art forms that people can do alone. Um, the visual arts with their hands, things like this. You even made the distinction about um, something the field has been debating for a long time, creative versus interpretive arts, by saying following instructions, playing an instrument. Of course, we all know there's more to playing an instrument than sure. following instructions. And I wonder if you uh, will have the ability to go into your data more deeply to look at that and to look at the kinds of skills uh, that might be translatable specifically into entrepreneurism and for communities. Yeah, we, we had not actually broken it down that way, but um, I can tell you that we have been looking at each of the groups and breaking them down by, for example, whether they uh, are producing companies and what kind of arts they're engaged in. Um, this is sort of off the top of my head remembering, and we have two of the researchers here so they can wave their hands and tell me I'm totally wrong. Uh, but my recollection is that in the founding companies, we are often talking about high rates of things like dancing, um, acting, 
theater arts, those kinds of things. Uh, writing skills are extremely important. So those are sort of popping up. And if you think about those, those are communication to groups or working with group uh, kinds of things. And that would make sense if you're going, I, I'm just thinking of, of, of one of my colleagues from uh, when I was an undergraduate. He was the director of, of the university acting program. And the first thing he did out of college was to go found a company. Um, to get everybody to work together and all the actors and the lighting people and everything you know, in, a, in a, a theater production obviously requires many of the same skills it's going to take to put together a company and make it actually work and do it under budget and, and all those kinds of things. And I think you're probably right that many of these people uh, are working, uh, the, the actual inventors who are getting a license, Patton for example, are probably working alone despite the fact that we have a lot of rhetoric about you know, group creativity and so forth and so on. Uh, a lot of the ideas are still coming from individuals. They then have to sell it to somebody. They have to work with groups. But the initiation of those is often by themselves, and they need those individual skills. So that will be something very interesting to look into. I, I wonder if you're able on that also to look at uh, the groups of inventors on those on specific patents um, and to see whether they're more likely to actually work yeah, we, you know, with more we collaborators. We don't have that data. Um, but I, Doug, I mean, I'd, do you have any way to look at it? with the patent data. Yeah, we're going to have to come back data. to you. It may surprise <laughs> you that we, do, but we can't distinguish one inventor from another, though. Yeah. John Smith in New York? Don't know. Uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, OK, so one last uh, question uh, right over here. Oh, uh, uh, Jack Walsh from the National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture. And actually, I have two questions. One's for Margaret, and then one for Douglas. So Margaret. I was very intrigued when you cited Creative Capital and Center for Cultural Innovation as being in the forefront of supporting artists, which of course they are. But it's important to recognize that their support is not just with professional skills, but they actually give dollars and grants for artists to create work. I think that's something that often gets missed when we talk about the economic um, sustainability of the field is that artists really need dollars as well as these professional skills. And Douglas, um, I just wanted to um, raise the, the question to you because you're, you're basing all the um, results of creativity, if I understand it correctly, on patents, which is great. But uh, there's also research that my organization has done that looks at actual hours of work, original work created over a year in a lot of community-based centers. I think is also an important thing for you to be looking at because it's copyrighted work, but it's over 335,000 hours of original programming. So I think that that should also come in when you're looking at the media arts to, to like what success can be tracked as, because patents is a very limited look at what media arts mm -hmm. is doing right now. Thank you. Absolutely, I agree, and I'd, I'd love to get a, get a hold of those kinds of measures. Uh, it'd be great. Well, and speaking of co uh, create, uh, cultural capital, um, yes, they, they uh, support the project, the person, the sort of infrastructure underneath it, and sort of market reach. And so what I think that really does is sort of tell us that the pipeline between entrepreneurship, creation, entrepreneurship, and innovation, which is then re reaching the market, is really a multi-phase process. And if we're not supporting all elements of it or finding a way to work that into the ecology, then we're not going to have the kind of impacts that we're, we're hoping for. And I think that that kind of, um, that, that, that uh, is true across all uh, levels of innovation, right? Mm -hmm. That you have initial ideas and and um, uh, uh, development and commercialization a, 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 across the uh, across the th that path. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in science and tech, for instance, they have a much more developed system of this. You know, in the arts, we tend not to have some of those right. intermediaries in place. Right, right. Oh, then they face the same kinds of risks as, mm -hmm. you, uh, as you point out. But, and university tech transfer offices don't know that there's arts programs right. at the universities, right. for instance. And, and that's part of the, what we're, <laughs> one of the things we're doing is we're shopping this research to those tech transfer offices to, who are constantly looking for new ways to pump up university profiles. And like, here's some potentially untapped resources you have on campus uh, that aren't even thinking about it. It's not on their radar. Maybe you can work and get it there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panel. And we won't hold you back from lunch. <clears throat>